morning, we're still morning, right, before 12. Uh, first of all, I want to say Sampurasun. <laughs> Correct. Sampurasun means in the uh, area where I was born in Indonesia, is a local wisdom that basically ask for permission to speak. I'm asking permission to speak today to you. And the answer, rampes. Okay, the answer from the audience should be rampes. Okay, so let's start. Sampurasun. Thank you. And the answer means that, yes, you can speak. And I also said, I ask permission to speak and also please forgive me if I say something that is not to your liking. And therefore you said, rampes, so I'm already forgiven. So I can talk nonsense. <laughs> or talk also about something that you may not like to hear. Okay, because I'm basically a devil's advocate. I'm a devil's advocate. I may be bringing in controversial issues. And I'm a storyteller. I will not be able to go through all my slides. But the copy of my presentation is available right now in Dropbox. You can immediately download it. Okay, immediately take a photograph of the link. It is there. I will not be able to go through all my slides, but my presentation has three parts. The first part is the little boring one, but the most important one, the summary. So I'm going backward. I'm starting with the most important first. And then the second part, is to illustrate life examples of what I'm saying. That's the kind of second part. And the third part is the supporting materials of the concept, the tech words. So with that, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be fast forward. Eddie, Professor Maslock talked about the old days. I love those old days too. I started with Amec in 1971 with Laxman Rao at the Ming Court Hotel. But I'm fast to basically what I learned these days from the younger generation, from the generation Fang, Facebook. Amazon, Netflix, and Google generally. And I'm bringing basically messages from them to all of you, to the old timers. And I'm going to also give two types of picture. One is a grim picture that may make you not sleep very well tonight. But on the other hand, also a new optimism that Asia is now, it looks like, becoming the center in what may be called by many people uh, the era where we call China, especially in artificial intelligence. Manfu Lee talked about that, okay? I'm talking about two perspectives, and I may not be able to do everything, but the materials are there for you, because you're good educators, you can learn on your own. I will only be providing the agenda setting, what to think about. Okay, let's start. Okay, before doing that, the topic is locus for group option. 
people say, what the hell is it? You will find in about five, seven minutes. Learning from Asian unicorns and sociopreneur. And then, what's the implication of Industry 4.0 as we transition to Society 5.0, especially within the context of today's conference? Materials are there. I need to acknowledge as professional that what I have been talking here doesn't come originally only from me, but it's an accumulative decades of discussion with various people in many countries where I was the keynote speaker. So this comes from a very, very global perspective from people in different conferences ranging from South Africa to all the way to Slovenia, the last one a couple of months ago. Every quarter, I issue the 10 most sexiest words, terminology, that people in our field or anybody who is interested in the future will need to know about. They don't know? Check it out. Fact check it. Google it. It's not my job to explain, just to give you the direction where and what to think about. These are the new words for this quarter. Reinvention, localization and adaptation, locus for global option, local success for global adoption. Disruption, subscription and sharing economy. Algorithm, big data analytics, psychographics. We all need to know all that. AI and AR, society 5.0, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, key concepts. Pentahelix, model of education, moving from triple helix to pentahelix. GS, G5, new paradigm. I'm a digital nomad. I spent 200 days on the road. Transformative learning and post-truth, of course, you all. I won't be able to talk about all that, but some of the materials are in part three of my presentation. Part one. I'm going to explain eight simple messages. And it is simple, it's not rocket science. Summary of lessons learned, emerging trends, and agenda setting for the future. What to think about? What do they have in common? They are all what we call communipreneurs. Communipreneurs. They are in the innovative business of communication. Now, disruption, especially in subsequent economy with CSNM. What is CSNM? Cloud. Social media and M mobile and artificial intelligence tech base essentially is communication center, communication base. Most of the tacit knowledge competencies, in my later part in supporting materials, I explain what the difference between tacit and explicit. I think many of you do know the difference between tacit and explicit those of you in the field of knowledge management, right? Most tacit knowledge competencies, especially in transdisciplinary, not even multi transdisciplinary approach, that is to connect the dots, ability to connect the dots, are not yet incorporated in most communication school curricula. I dealt, I'm in the series seven, not the BMW, I'm series seven, 70 years old. But in order to make myself relevant, I've got to learn from the 20s, 25 years old as to what they do, why they do, and how they do it. 
all my education at Stanford, at all the good schools, is of no value today. It's the fact that I bought startup guys that makes life still interesting for an old guy like me. Only few startup community entrepreneurs credit their formal education as the source of their success. And I can prove it. I just talked to 34 best startup young guys under the YSILI program, the Young Southeast Asian Leader Initiative in Ubud. 34 Southeast Asian best startup companies. In transforming from industry four to five zero, tacit knowledge mastery of moral integrity, ethics, humanitarian value, legal rights and responsibilities is needed. Nevertheless, presently, we see a reversal from globalization, from globalization to globalization and to what I call locus for globe adoption phenomena. Later, I will have slides to support all this assertion. Geopolitically, the present trade war is not as dangerous and problematic as a technology war that we are going to have which may create incompatibility in global communication protocol and platforms, thus threatening and inhibiting a synergic global networking, collaboration, and partnership. To help minimize development and problem, a conceptual framework for a transdisciplinary tacit knowledge global intervention curriculum for 2020 to 2030 is provided. Here it is. You can see it later, study it in detail, and here are the parts combining with explicit knowledge and focusing on the issues that I mentioned about. Curriculum reform is needed because the transition of information, communication, education. A shift from triple to pentahelix I mentioned earlier, need technology brokering, and big data in the mapping. Global tens competing with the and holistic inter and transdisciplinary learning and thinking. The changing goal of universities, not longer as knowledge generator can provide, but as tacit knowledge Not only to prepare graduates for a job, but to create jobs. It's different emphasis, different curriculum that you need to have. Not only to teach on skills, but learning on how to learn, to unlearn, and to relearn. And again, connecting the dot, as I mentioned about the need for transdisciplinary education. Education reform is the educational revolution. Why? Because we need to bring into campus and assign start business social partners, unicorn disruptors, top managers and executives, regular university teaching members. By doing students and professors can learn much relevant needed tacit knowledge from them. So instead of me and my fellow old timers talking, we better bring the start entrepreneurs and instructors so that we can learn from them those who have technical uh, uh, tacit knowledge. The university should bring to campus the likes of these people, Nadim, Anitan, Sachin, and Besa, Jack Ma, CEO, proven successful company that changed our way of life. Education institution and think tanks should for, forge with them knowledge incubation and building partnership corporate universities with startup co-working spaces and similar professional development organizations should involve partner with them in providing top knowledge 
sharing and brokering service. So, the agenda setting, issues to think about. Transforming educators into entrepreneurs. Why? In order to prepare students not for jobs, but create jobs. So what do we need to know? We, what are the public needs versus wants gap in the disruption area? What needs are be reinvented? How are you responding to such needs? How curriculum reform started and what, what results? What are you to turn professors into entrepreneurs? So that part one. Able to explain everything, but I just okay to run quickly. These are basically why the business models are using mainly OPM, OPM, and OPR. What is it? Other people's money, other people's resources, other people's network. They created the subset, produce unicorn. We all know that. For whom, etc. Digital literate, there's a gap. Gap is not between rich and poor, but the digital literates and digital illiterates. Look at this. But they become the largest. What they are communication, the process and tools. We take four years being eaten by like a Airbnb. Look at it. Singapore Incorporated. My friend from Singapore, they agree. But they said the end of Singapore. Because 47% of the GDP are eaten away by the new companies. New companies who are trading who are them or the clones of them. We are. Have we done that? Share the economy, of course. These are the people who need we need to be concerned people like me. This is the problem. In Europe and in North America, but the application, the adoption, are higher here in Asia and Latin America. Factor right there as compared in the area where the innovation is invented. Big implication. The story about Gojek. The limits of Silicon Valley, Indonesia, got Uber. From Gojek to become anything. You can have go mass, go clean, go food, go sand, go clean, go everything. Look at the investors, global investors. Starting with 20 drivers in eight years, become one hundred drivers. Copying, yeah. Uber is copying Gojek. Flipkart. India story. The competition between Amazon and Walmart. Walmart cannot use Amazon, so they they bring they have to buy Flipkart. Right? The the two guys who started Flip uh, Flipkart work at Amazon. And then they quit and then they become big in India and now they are becoming the brain of Walmart. Started Asia now is going to run the West. Ricardo Kaipoli said that you are now in charge. <clears throat> you are in charge. No longer in you are in charge. And look at the the game, the game between China 
and US. Perception AI, the score five years ago is nine to US, one to China. In 10 years, it will be China, eight, US, two. In the race for artificial intelligence supremacy, the Look, this look at the Huawei. The Huawei. All right. So now the era copy of China. This problem. To make more, Ramon mentioned about robot or not. Make it more realistic. The issue is not only that. How to increase the income of the state if the robots lost displacement was taxes? So now they are proposing to tax robots. Robots will be taxed. That's the biggest issue now in California. So we start to see a reversal of the global concept. If we see a new phenomenon that is local success for adoption. Success story from Asia being copied all over the world now. Ediko, who is going to do research on this? This is the kind of thing that we need to study. Okay, if you can refer needed, I have to quickly. Okay, this is so sorry. You have going to show you these are social the 34 stuff here I was talking about that I met in Ubud okay yeah. stories from Singapore from Myanmar and from other places finally education is not really effective look at this the tuition goes up the quality over 30 years stays Cost goes up, quality is the same. There's a problem there. Why? It's irrelevant. The education is irrelevant nowadays. All right? So, okay. That's it. And the third will be all the supporting materials about algorithm and everything else you can see here, not just Uber, etc. Okay. So, enjoy the slide on your own. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you can sleep well tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ronnie Adekaria. I'm the disruptor of Ronnie. So, Dr. Ronnie raised a lot of issues on what would be the role of universities, higher education institutions, into this knowledge sharing and disruptive technology. So, fortunately, the next resource person is a university <laughs> president and may not be ready to answer some of your issues and concerns, Dr. To, Ronnie, uh, but it's equally <laughs> evident. May we now present our new member of parliament from the Philippines, Dr. Jose Francisco Benitez. Thank you. Uh, can you see me if I sit, or do I have to be a storyteller like Dr. Ron? <clears throat> um, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I will bring you back to a period of time in time when people had to listen and not take pictures of slides <laughs> on screens. Um, and that's actually part of the message I think that I also have as part of my talk. I am sandwiched between two great communication scholars and I am not a communication scholar. Uh, my field is actually comparative literature. So I'd like to uh, thank Amic for the invitation to join this panel this morning. Um, and I speak not even as a comparative literature scholar but primarily in my current position and soon to be vacated position as a university administrator um, with very narrow concerns about budgets and curriculum. Um, <clears throat> uh, concerns with how to best serve our students, how to best prepare them for their lives after they leave us at the university. Uh, Philippine higher education, for those of you who may not know, is currently undergoing a major, major upheaval. We have just uh, adopted a K-12 curriculum 
and has and uh, is undergoing a transition where all curricula in higher education, which is centrally uh, mandated by the Commission on Higher Education, is undergoing review. And in fact, for communications, the head of the technical panel is Mr. Ramon Tuasson himself. So any blame for the new curriculum in communication falls squarely upon Ramon's shoulders. Thank you, Ramon. Um, but really, uh, they have changed the, the GE requirements. They have removed Filipino as a requirement to graduate in, in university and so on. It's been a very controversial transition uh, for the Philippines. Um, they have also uh, shifted to what they call an outcomes-based education, where the competencies uh, and the outcomes of a degree have to be quantified by the institutions. This is all part and parcel of government's view of our function as universities, uh, as human resource generators, to give our students the jobs that they need when they graduate, and to give the state the labor that they need to develop. Um, as a response to some of the things, actually, that uh, Dr. Ronnie has uh, pointed out, I'm going to give you three initiatives that the Philippine Women's University is trying to do to cope. Now, I'm not sure we have all the right answers. Uh, I'm not sure this will be the end of our unfolding uh, coping mechanisms to the changing terrain. But one of them, actually, is a uh, adoption of uh, insight from NUS, from the National University of Singapore. So the Philippine Women's University is embarking upon creating a system of micro-credentials for continuing education to allow students who are no longer students, right? Non-traditional students, our alumni, adult students, and so on, to have an easy way to enter and leave formal instruction, to curate the kind of skill sets that they need, um, perhaps for a certificate, not necessarily, right? Uh, as part and parcel of a fast changing pace of skills required by industry. But that initiative, the first initiative of creating a series of micro-credentials, um, really simply addresses a skills gap between the academe and industry. And our function is not only to provide skills training for individuals, but to shape the very societies that these individuals actually constitute. In that light, the Philippine Women's University joined two research initiatives um, funded by the Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities. The first was a survey of millennials by FEU. Uh, the Far Eastern University of, the, of, uh, of Manila uh, conducted a massive survey about the attitudes of entering uh, university students, which they called their millennial project. One of the results of this survey, which was quite interesting, uh, that took many of the, uh, the researchers by surprise, was that it seems that the millennials entering our universities were people who galvanized around issues and events that they cared very deeply about and would be willing to form short-term alliances to address a specific, issues, a specific issue. But they were not interested, or so they claim, in politics. They were not interested in activism. They were not interested in ideologies and they were not interested in parties per se. In other words, the implication of the research was that millennials have very short attention spans but care very deeply about the world they find themselves in. Um, this was followed up by an ongoing research by Centro Escolar University on the nature of critical thinking that can be localized and derived organically from Philippine uh, conditions. Because CEU feels very strongly that our assumptions about being human 
about the borders and the boundaries between nature and culture, between the technological and the organic, the physical, biological, and the digital are all blurry. This is, of course, the Carl Schwab Fourth Industrial Revolution premise. Um, and the blurring of these boundaries are creating anxieties over stable categories and meta-narratives. But we've had these insights for some time. One could cite Lyotard's postmodern condition or Donna Haraway's uh, cyborg manifesto in the 80s, for example. But one could say that what the fourth industrial revolution uh, distinguishes is really the idea that the world is now being converted into information and into data. And this information and, in, and data now needs to be managed, needs to be articulated in a language to make it useful. It needs to be communicated. We are thus in a mediated world whether it is in 3D printing or big analytics, right, or big data and so on, and you have all of Dr. Ronnie's slides on Dropboxer, right, to discuss how uh, these issues um, affect us. I would like to propose, though, that technology actually reconfigures how we know and how we act in the world. Its function is actually to inframe and disclose how we dwell in the world, how we relate to the world around us, but perhaps most importantly for me as an educator, uh, how we relate to each other. Current technology seems to reconstitute these social relations in a very material but very abstract manner. It reconstitutes an abstract mode of engagement with the world mediated through language and communication. Abstract but material and mediated based on information and languages with consequences for how our communities are organized, mobilized, how we understand ourselves, how we create our identities as embodied, even as we recognize each category as unstable. I think that's the difficult part in this explosion of knowledge and information, is that categories seem to be always contestable, always a site of struggle, and struggles seem to be very difficult to sustain unless they are very short-term and event-dependent. Uh, so, uh, these issues are relevant to our current redefinitions of society, redefinitions of gender, redefinition of sexuality, redefinition of uh, community, and so on. I think the question for me and the question for us at Philippine Women's University, given the constraints that we have with regards to our new GE, our new general education curriculum, and the parameters set to us by the Commission on Higher Education, is we need to explore the forms of sociality, the types of community, and the cultivation of the kind of members to these communities that we want to engender. What are the social forms that we have? Social media, confirmation bias, fake news, right? It's side-by-side uh, -side with its democratic potentials, right? Allows almost anyone to find any kind of community online. This means you can get support no matter how extreme or how non-mainstream your views might be. And yet at the same time, it allows those who are disempowered and in need of community support to find members to support them. So what do we do in terms of our curricular reform, which is of course what my topic supposedly was today in response, I didn't know, to to Dr. Ronnie, right? Um, how do we ensure that the choices of engagement that our students have are ethical? Or as Simon Cooper has asked, to what extent might we wish to embrace a mode of social integration based upon fleeting, intangible relations with others? And in what context of radical, ambiguous, 
openness, and uncertainty? How do the values which are constructed within this more abstract social modality affect our more concrete modes of social integration, particularly if we are interested in a kind of mobilization for social change? I am not sure we have the answer at Philippine Women's University, but what we have done is to create additional courses to the general education courses of, uh, of CHED, the Commission on Higher Education. We've added a course, for example, on metacognition and critical thinking with the assumption that all general education courses have to be historically, geographically, and culturally deeply comparative with the space for self-reflexivity and community engagement through, towards social development through collaborative, interdisciplinary service learning and project-based education. Ideally, that partners from industry can come in and assess the outputs of our students. Embedded in that curricular change in our new liberal arts curriculum is an awareness of the kind of metacognitive processes specific to each discipline regardless of who the student is in the general education classroom, whether this be a pharmacist, a teacher, a culinary arts student, a communication arts student, or a fine arts student, or a musician. So that would be the second uh, innovation that we have tried to do to address the very issues that Dr. Ronnie has put up. The third one is to create a student transformation system that tracks student activities and engagement with non-academic initiatives that they need like a badge system from Girl Scouts, for example, to complete in order to graduate. So aside from their uh, academic requirements, they have a non-academic transformation requirements, which include a range of topics from family life, which is a problem for transnational families in the Philippines, to mental health, right, and mindfulness. Because we have discovered there's an increase epidemic, if you like, of mental health issues among our students. And much of that uh, stemming from a paucity of an internal world uh, that used to be addressed uh, by spiritual uh, formation, for example, because we are a non-sectarian, non-denominational school. Um, so that would be the third. The first was micro-credentials for con continuing education. The second was the development of uh, critical thinking and metacognition classes as a space for students to actually discuss what makes them human and what makes their cognitive processes human and embedding some of that in the general education courses that must be deeply comparative across history, culture, and geography. The last is to create a system for students to track what they learn outside of the classroom, ideally about other people, whether it be mental health or family, right, or whatever other kinds of quote-unquote non-academic interests that they may have, including uh, engaging with the local community. So, I ask, a space like what we have today is increasingly, increasingly rare. A space like the university is where we can have a discourse to rationally think about and discuss what it does mean to be human. I think the premise of Ramon's question is actually slightly off. The question is not, are you human? The question is really, what does it take to be human? And spaces like an AMIC conference is where we jointly and together, through empathy and mutual respect, explore this very question again and again. Good morning and thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benitez.
Very interesting discussion. She did not only reply, responded to the issues raised by Rani, but you know, raised his, or his own issues as well. But uh, it's nice to know that higher education, that there's hope in higher education <laughs> institutions. <laughs> Am I correct? Or that's another wrong assumption, that there's hope in higher education institutions in rediscovering our humanity. I don't know about Dr. Jack Chui, who will be our last, but certainly not the last speaker. Thank you, uh, AMIC uh, organizers, for uh, inviting me back. It's a huge honor okay, to, to join AMIC again and uh, to be uh, on this uh, uh, panel with my esteemed uh, colleagues. I come the opposite side of the South China Sea. But I want to tell you, you know, that my, my basic argument is cannot be more uh, similar. Okay? We share the basic uh, similar uh, uh, argument, which is uh, new technologies, digital technologies, are uh, you know, bringing great transformations, including great opportunities to make us better, but also great grave dangers, okay, challenges to make us less human. And by human, I uh, use a very simple definition. You know, uh, that is freedom. Freedom is, and uh, freedom including at the collective level and uh, individual level, okay, as uh, free will is an essential human nature. And then the struggle to maintain our humanity, one of the most important struggle is to fight against slavery. So it's the same argument, but I'm adding some spices into it now that we're in Thailand. Spicier, the bet better, <laughs> all right? And so, so the basic argument I'm going to talk about today, okay, I will try to wrap this up uh, as quickly as possible so that we can go to lunch. Right? And so the, 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 the basic argument is this, okay, is that the, uh, these ICTs, okay, internet, smartphone, cloud, okay, uh, robots, AI, you know, this, uh, this is one of the most dehumanizing social structures and tendencies humanity has ever faced. But then these uh, this, uh, new challenges of dehumanization actually present with us uh, unprecedented opportunity to create what this conference calls new humanism. So this argument came out from uh, actually uh, mostly my, my, my recent book okay, uh, by University of Illinois Press called Goodbye I Slave. But it actually built on an uh, earlier work I published 10 years ago called Working Class Network Society which was a summary of my uh, uh, field work in China's, uh, mostly uh, uh, factory zones in southern China since 2002. So the uh, thesis for my, uh, the first book on the left, if, if I can summarize into one sentence, is that okay, uh, uh, creativity, okay, in, when we talk about new media, innovation, okay, most important thing is creativity. Creativity does not just come from Wall Street or Silicon Valley where people have all the luxury of funds and uh, scientific knowledge, but also, okay, this is the thesis, okay, creativity comes from the existential threats facing the working people of China and of Asia. Can people see that my slide? Okay, so I'm talking like so, so, so I'm, I'm talking about my two books. So I already finished the first one. Okay, on the, on that book cover. Okay, it says Working Class Network Society. It's a, it's a, it's a working class community uh, in Guangzhou where I uh, where I lived to conduct my field work. On the right hand side, there's a book cover for my uh, uh, University of Illinois uh, Press book called uh, Goodbye I Slave. I Slave was actually a campaign slogan created by SACOM, students and uh, scholars against corporate misbehavior. It's a labor NGO in Hong Kong. And, and then they designed this uh, campaign against slavery conditions in Chinese sweatshops. Okay, and actually, Greenpeace was also involved. Greenpeace Switzerland was also in, 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 you know, in, in involved. So I borrowed the, the, uh, the language, I slave from them, but uh, added, uh, expanded into a uh, uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, volume. Okay, so this is also a salute to the many civil society, you know, members in this room. Okay, to your uh, great activism, 
if you buy this book, it will be 400 baht, okay, which will be, but, but I will take a cut from your purchase. But, but all that money will go to a peace radio in the Kivu province of Eastern Congo to support okay, a radio, community radio promoting peace, environmental justice, and human rights, including labor rights okay, in, uh, in Congo. Why that radio station is because every single one of us in this room, if you have a digital device, no matter if it's a mobile phone or a laptop, it contains conflict minerals from the Congo. So by buying this book, you, know, you can also create or use it in your classes. You can, this is a material contribution to international solidarity to clean up the supply chain that leads to our smart devices. And, and also, by buying this book, you can ignore the rest of my, my presentation because I'm just talking about the main points. So should we learn from China? The question is, which China? Is it this China that has the world's largest uh, uh, sweatshop? Uh, the Wired magazine, this is a few years ago, says one million people. Okay? And uh, actually, the, at the highest point, it had uh, this one uh, uh, company called Foxcom, is the world's largest electronics manufacturer, actually had 1.4 million workers, according to Wall Street uh, you know, Journal. What is 1.4 million? That is a m number larger than all the armed forces of the United States combined. So this actually is a, 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 a very rich imperial ground for us to think about what is Asian communication research or Asian social and cultural research at large. It should be de-westernized so that when we think about digital media, we should think about digital media in the industrial era, not in the post-industrial era. Right, so the, uh, the, this is how the Asian reality is so different. People think about, including people in China, in Hong Kong, think about digital media is post-industrial. But no. If you look at the UN uh, statistics, using 2005 constant US dollar as a measure, the, the global industrial output has actually tripled since the 1970s, not reduced. But the Western scholars are thinking, oh, it's, it's post-industrial because the factories left Europe, left North America. Where do they, where do they come from? Or where, or where are they now? They're in Thailand. They're in Asia. They're in China. And many of these uh, factories are operating in these kind of conditions. Okay, when I go to the workers, I ask them, how do you describe your working condition? The most common way they describe it, I'm quoting them, you know, direct quotes, okay, is to say, they work men like women. Or they, they, they work women like men. And they work men like robots. So being worked like a robot is nothing funny for them. Okay, it actually causing, so on this, on this magazine cover, you can see 17 suicides in a short period of a few months. Right? And so, the, so here you see the dehumanized human faces you know, on this slide. But also, uh, uh, on the up, up there, there's a, that, that the guy's name is called Xu Lizhi. He's now the most celebrated poet for the uh, uh, entire Chinese literary scene. He was a worker who committed suicide, but a very achieved poet. Poem, poetry, as an expression of, as a, as a, uh, for humanity, or our, 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 our uh, uh, freedom, okay, and our, our humanity, is actually, you know, uh, reached the high point, you know, during these suicides not suppressed. So this is what we are learning about the slavery-like conditions in Chinese factories and also how it can create new humanism. But exactly what is slavery? Okay, it started, like I said, it was a campaign slogan and I did not understand what was slavery back then. So I went to read several hundred books, mostly historian, uh, socio historical so sociologists, Okay, and uh, uh, political scientists, but uh, and also legal scholars. Slavery has actually been used as a criminal charge in The Hague, in the ICC, and also in the Australian court in recent years. So how do they exactly define slavery? You know, so this is a summary of seven points. How do we uh, de uh, define slavery in the modern, you know, uh, in the 21st century? First, slavery is an essential feature of a historical process. 
Okay, and uh, it, even today, there are still 21st century slavery, you know, in, uh, uh, around the world in terms, in, in ways of human trafficking, for example. And uh, slavery is uh, notoriously mutating. It always changes. Once there's a, a successful abolition movement, it will change shape, okay? Sometimes it's inmates, the prisoners, but at other times it could be very high end. okay? So this is Latin word from ancient Rome. Familia Caesaris. Okay, so this is the slaves of Caesar, the emperor. When Caesar left Rome, this slave of, Ro of Caesar actually is the mayor of Rome. He can rule uh, Rome, you know, he has immense military and uh, wealth than average Roman citizens or even the member of the Senate. However, okay, they can, uh, uh, they can be killed, okay, without any legal process. Okay, once the emperor dislike him. Okay, I only have five minutes, so I, I, will, I will go very quickly, okay, yes. Like I said, you can buy the book and know the, all the arguments. So the goal of the uh, uh, s slavery is actually to, uh, to uh, exploit, okay, the body and the labor of the enslaved people unfairly, and sociologically it's defined by Orlando Patterson as natal alienation. So once the social existence, social relations of the person is removed, Okay, and that, that person can be treated as a commodity, then it is slavery. Okay. And then uh, uh, the, the, the next most important lesson from this uh, uh, slavery literature, comparative slavery studies literature, is to say resistance and abolition is an essential part for our understanding of what slavery is. Slavery regime, like I said, they, it always mutates. How it mutates is actually in response to the, uh, how the resistance and abolition movement happens. And slave system of wax and when, okay, this okay, uh, clash of the big powers, the US and China, probably could be another uh, historical term for slave empires towards uh, uh, its decline. And the hegemonic consumption, culture, communication, now we are studying media, okay, and uh, this is actually a pillar of slave empowered uh, economies from the Dutch empire to the British to the current one. So the, uh, uh, these are two points summarizing the current latest uh, uh, legal uh, scholarship on slavery definition. It's called the Bellagio Harvard uh, definition okay, of slavery. So slavery is, is now defined by international community as de facto condition, not de jure status. It's not you and I sign a paper saying you are my master, I am your slave. No longer we, we have this kind of slavery definition, but you, you, have, you have to look at de facto factors, looking at the powers attached to the right of ownership. If someone can own you, can possess you, can transfer you, can make a profit from the transfer and also dispose you when you are sick or, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, injured, okay, then that accounts as slavery. And slavery, or more precisely using the legal language as the institutions and practices similar to slavery. This is how 21st century slavery is defined. It's similar, not identical to historical slavery, all right? And, uh, and it exists if any of the powers, so it's a very low threshold, uh, uh, any of the de facto powers of possession, transfer of profit, or uh, disposal exist. This is my theory visualization of the definition of how to define slavery. At the bottom is to see the mutating uh, you know, uh, geopolitical basis for slavery empires, and then you have alienation and resistance as the two pillars, and it has to go through consumerism, uh, co hegemonic communication to reach exploitation, and it's defined by the de facto conditions. So. Um, Two types of slavery are discussed in this uh, book. One is manufacturing, so the uh, uh, workers who work on assembly lines who cannot leave. Okay, I, I, I interviewed workers who, according to China's labor law, you can leave when you don't want to work in that factory. But, fac but Fox actually, you know, the regime was structured in such a way people cannot leave at free will. Manu uh, and the second part is called manufacture the I slave. So that is, you know, we are we feel the compul compulsion to always check our Facebook or WeChat, okay? And then our time, you know, in, uh, in Chinese language, we call them our, uh, our uh, 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 fifth limb, okay? Or uh, we sometimes call our third skin. It's almost like a shackle, so a, a digital shackle. And then uh, our data, if we treat our data in the cloud as an organic part of our humanity, our human existence, then that humanity is actually being in shackles, like the slave regimes, okay, that we observed in history. 
So to fast forward, this is the manufacturing ice slave. On the left-hand side is the Congo workers extracting uh, uh, conflict minerals. On the left-hand side is the Foxconn workers. These are the suicides, okay, you probably all heard about. And they are all people of very young age. Okay, you, you know, usually uh, old people with sickness will commit suicide. It's relatively, okay, more common, but it's very uncommon to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, young people without any sickness who would commit suicide because they were treated like quote-unquote robots. This is how Foxconn uh, facilities uh, you know, s spread in China. I did, m did most of my work in the Pearl River Delta in Shenzhen and in Kunshan near Shanghai. Kunshan used to use, uh, uh, to use uh, made lots of iP uh, iPads, but now Chengdu in Western China uh, produced most of the world's iPads. And uh, uh, Zhengzhou in central China produced most of the world's iPhones. The daily production uh, capacity for Zhengzhou iPhone production line is one million iPhones per day. So these are the living conditions, three level bunker beds without air conditioning in Shenzhen. Okay, and, it is, it's, uh, and it's almost a, a separate jurisdiction okay, compared to the other parts of Shenzhen. So it reminds of the Fetorias, the slave trading okay, uh, enclaves off the coast of West Africa. And then if you look inside, the, 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 uh, I have an analysis part of uh, the, these dormitories, the ventilation condition is like the middle passage going from Africa to uh, uh, the Caribbean and the Americas. The student interns okay, were almost like okay, slave okay, markets uh, where the intermediaries take a, take a cut. If you don't okay, uh, 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 finish your quote-unquote internship in Foxconn, you cannot graduate. I interviewed many uh, uh, students who were in tears okay, after being forced to work uh, tedious and uh, very painful jobs. And then people were disposed, okay, once you are sick, okay, this is actually from Chinese news media, despite the, the uh, uh, censorship. Okay, you, you, you are injured and then you had nothing to do with the, uh, the, uh, the law. The worst is the anti-jumping nets. Foxconn actually put up this anti-jumping net to prevent his workers from killing themselves. Okay? You know, the, so this, this device is only uh, uh, this, uh, recorded in the history of slavery. When the anti-jumping nets was a standard uh, equipment on top of the slave ships going from West Africa to the, to the New World, okay? And they reappear, okay, on top of the uh, factories making our iPhones and iPads. I challenged all my labor activists and historians to tell me another factory in the world that has anti-jumping nets. Nobody, I, I've challenged hundreds of them. I challenge people in this room. There's no other textile or automobile uh, factory with these anti-jumping nets on top. So uh, with the darkening of sky, okay, so this is the crucial turn of my book, okay, the, the, the darkest moments uh, you know, of hu uh, dehumanizing sweatshops, actually we see stars shining more brightly like in Hong Kong, okay, uh, you, if you are following the news, yesterday, two million people, actually we say two million plus one person, uh, you know, were in the street yesterday, because one person committed suicide two nights ago in Hong Kong, in order f to support the freedom, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, demonstration. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm already giving the sign, my time is up. There are brilliant stories from historical uh, s uh, scholarship, but the most important one is to tell us communication is very, very important. Anti-slavery is not only about the American Civil War. It's about our, me, our daily media practices. And then there are abolition and resistance, including in, uh, in Thailand. But actually, I go to many countries. Many, uh, every uh, major country in the world actually has slavery. It's not just China, the US, you know, India. Indonesia, I was told by Indonesian, you know, the, the, the Dutch, the VOC, or they're also major slave trade. Every major, uh, you know, uh, uh, country in the world has an uh, abolition movement in its history, which is actually a, mo a moment for our intellectual solidarity to rehumanize our understanding of the digital media. I'm going to fast forward this part, uh, okay, but the most important thing is about 
W, uh, we, we always talk about user-generated contents. But here, I want to invite uh, readers of my book, if you're interested, to consider another concept called worker-generated content, uh, content. So these are collectively generated contents who are used for empowerment, for social change, like this in the Chinese Twitter, okay, called Weibo. Like this, it's a poetry uh, from on my, on my WeChat. Okay, and uh, it's, a, it's a musical rhythm from the Song Dynasty more than a thousand years ago. But then it's used, you know, in this uh, uh, WeChat, there are, there are videos. I did, a, this is an old sociological uh, analytical tool called property space analysis. I, 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 each dot in this uh, slide is an online video. So I, uh, you, I can show people there are seven possibilities, logical possibilities, if you will, we want to create WGC and then they're distributed in, in this empirical pattern that I observe. Despite the uh, great uh, uh, you know, heroism we saw in the Chinese uh, uh, you know, anti-slavery uh, 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 movements, they're still not comparable to the Atlantic theater. So I, with this, I want to you know, I'll, I'll echo what uh, uh, Dr. Jose just, Jose just said. We need to do comparative historical uh, you know, analysis. And if we compare, actually Shakespeare's last play was inspired by a slave uprising called The Tempest. Right? And then the, uh, uh, there, are, there are major, the, uh, the, the, the end of uh, the Atlantic slavery was not just legislation by Westminster or uh, the American Civil War, but also popular literature, which was the new media of the time. But also the meme, this was the most popular abolitionist meme okay, in the 19th century. Okay, uh, ladies, okay, royal family members would go, and use, uh, go out and use this anti-slavery meme, which in a way you know, brings us back, uh, if we compare to this digital media era, i-slave meme. Okay, there are still things we can learn from the, the, uh, from the 19th century struggle. And that there are uh, new, uh, new free produ uh, produce stores against, okay, uh, this is like a fair phone, okay, it's like fair trade, okay, in, uh, so that we can have a cleaner supply chain and a better, uh, you know, uh, working conditions in the Chinese factories. I actually went to fair phone factory in Suzhou and interviewed their workers. The workers in that factory also make Apple products. And the, uh, even though you have never heard about fair phone, but all the workers in that uh, uh, factory know uh, uh, making this smartphone actually uh, is less demanding and you can make more money and you are treated less like robots. There's a mobile phone game. I use this game in my class, it's for free. You can download it if you use Android. Apple Inc. actually censored, it's not just Beijing censored media, all right? Apple also censored, corporate censorship. You cannot download this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, phone. You know, uh, uh, the phone game is called. It's just called the the, the phone game. Okay, but uh, but I uh, ask my student to go online. There's an online version, or you can use Android to play this educational game. And finally, there's this is the latest movement we are doing in Hong Kong. It's called platform cooperativism, so that uh, similar, okay, like Uber can be owned by drivers or, or Gojek can be owned by each driver, not just by the Silicon Valley or Beijing-based companies, but by the actual working people in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, for example. And so this is a global uh, movement. So to conclude, I'd like to say that we, we, what, is, what is human? Oh, how can there be a new humanism? It's better to reconsider okay, uh, freedom and uh, humanity using the negative. Okay? We can define them in a negative way, okay? Th so that we are not treated like a slave. This is, a ver this is my... my uh, 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 most important uh, provocation. Uh, and then the, the, if we compare 21st century slavery and 17th century slavery in the Atlantic uh, theater, okay, with the Middle Passage and also the abolition and anti-slavery okay, uh, uh, movements uh, centuries ago, we see pernicious parallels in between the 21st and the six, uh, 17th centuries. You know, the manufacturing and the manufactured, the ice slaves. So labor resistance through worker-generated content, WGC, and new anti-slavery movements of various kinds is a material basis for us to envision and for us to make it materialize this new humanism in Asia rooted in our existing uh, social structures of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jack.
Every time you use your smartphones, think of slaves working to give you smartphones. Okay, so stop using smartphones. Okay, give your smartphones to me. I, I accept donation. <laughs> Okay. Well, my, so, my, my conclusion is not to stop using smartphones, but, yes, but use smartphones for the working people, yes. not for the slave owners in Silicon Valley or Shenzhen. Okay, so we have room for two robots to ask questions. Two robots to ask questions. Uh, lunch will be served shortly, so no robot volunteer to ask question or anyone with artificial intelligence who would like to ask a question so I, i'll go to this side because i think the heavyweights are in this side so <laughs> anyone may i ask dr benitez and dr rani to join jack there so somebody is helping me so you can please identify yours yourself prove that you're not a robot and then ask question yes sir yes uh, my name is Habit Chen from Taiwan I have a question to the Dr. Quinn and um, okay currently you have that kind of observation but is there any kind of a historical comparity between 20 years ago the people in the East Asia country doing the global assembly to the semiconductor that kind of a job. Uh, what's the difference between that part and currently the first kind in China, that weight assembly? Any kind of difference between these two scenarios? How about your opinion? Uh, first, uh, that is something I have not studied. So maybe you can write that book, okay? Or people in this book, you know, in this. But my uh, 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 very, very, you know, uh, intuitive okay, response is that the process has become more flexible and more centralized. So if we talk about 20, uh, 30 years ago in Taiwan, there are uh, at least half a dozen major uh, uh, manufacturers for electronics. Okay? And, uh, but now you have only one or two. Okay? So it's, uh, it's, it's either uh, Foxconn or Pegatron. And uh, so, the, so uh, rather than uh, digital economy making us more decentralized, it's actually much more centralized, which, which and, and join this trend of sharing economy. Okay, it's like sharing economy on the one hand at the labor end, okay, at the input labor in terms both of physical labor, driving the car or taking care of Airbnb, or the algorithmic labor, okay, it's very decentralized. But actually, they are much more centralized, okay, like the, the, uh, uh, the Silicon Valley can just sit there and get all the money, all, all the data in from the rest of the world. So, the, so even the, the competition within Silicon Valley has declined. You know tremendously, so that so the, the the world has become even closer to a slavery uh, condition. If I can say, yeah. thank you, Jack. May I, as a teacher, I usually ask my students seated at the back to ask the first questions because usually they're sleeping or cheating. So anyone at the back who would like to ask question? Yes, ma'am, you're in the middle. But yes, last question from the robot at the middle, the beautiful robot. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, may, yes, may I, Anita. Yes, please. that was an excellent, all the, uh, you know, uh, talks were really very introspective and learning for us as teachers. I have a question for Mr. Benetis uh, regarding your uh, research which you did and the three aspects you mentioned, uh, which are the ways to go ahead to counter uh, the challenges that is micro credentials you said and uh, uh, develop critical thinking and a system are these being implemented yes and what is the reaction so far we just started actually it oh, would so, be very interesting so to, we started uh, last year fine um, then I'll keep your contact which I do have of the earlier yes, time <laughs> because it makes a lot of uh, practical sense to see the viability. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Mom? All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mr. Raman for moderating this wonderful session and also uh, for our fantastic speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um,
I'm sure you all agree that this has been a stimulating morning, and I feel honored and so proud to have been given the opportunity to take part in this ceremony. And on behalf of Jhulalongkorn University, I would like to thank you, you all, once more for joining us on this wonderful event. And however, the day is far from over. In the afternoon session, we have lots of interesting session, and please find a detailed breakdown of the program in front of this room and on the flo fourth floor. Um, intellectual activity is a hungry business, and I'm sure that everyone is ready for lunch. Jhulalongkorn University prepare you uh, lunch that, uh, with all range of Thai cuisine that suit all tastes and requirements. Uh, and lunch is provided on the fourth floor uh, where you can all gather together for food discussion and networking. And lastly, I hope it's still not too late to offer you a very warm welcome to Thailand from all of us here at Jhulalongkorn University. Thank you very much for your participation and your kind attention. And before we leave this room for lunch, we are going to have a group photo. So please, may I request you from this side of uh, the, the, the room to move over across to this side of the room. We are going to take a photo. Our photographer will be here and we're going to take a group photo on this side of the room. So please kindly move to the left side of the room, please. <laughs>